All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody to live valuation. I'm Midas Moriarty, and today we're going to be taking a look at ticker BBW Build a Bear Workshop. Definitely think this is going to be a pretty interesting one to look at. I'm curious to see where it lines up. Uh, the numbers look really, really good. It's one of the companies that we came up with uh, through our screening process that we did through for a couple of screens. But I also see that it's uh, appreciated quite a lot in the most recent period and does have a, a factor of having really great earnings in the most recent year. Uh, and seeing where that's gonna actually line up uh, relative to uh, what we think for the future is always the big question. So we'll definitely see about that. Um, I, with the results of all the screenings that we did and uh, kind of me rooting through several of them and kind of ranking them based off of which ones I thought were most appealing and picking and choosing a little bit, I did kind of come up with this little list over here. Uh, obviously it's not including uh, Build-A-Bear Workshop, which we already did. Uh, or, or will be doing today so it's not on this list this is going to be the list of what we're doing forward and this is kind of a general order of which it is these numbers are just kind of relative to the the scoring system i used to kind of decide which order i was going to put them in and it was basically like the least points got the the best position just kind of a little thing i did um but either way so i'm expecting to do hibbit um on thursday now i do say thursday we have been doing our streams on monday and friday a lot recently but i actually am planning to shift it to Monday and Thursday moving forward, uh, partially because I've been trying to do other more produced content like uh, shorter videos that I'm trying to release on a every other week kind of schedule and I plan for those to come out on Saturday. So I kind of just want the content to be well distributed throughout the week. Hey, what's up GT? Um, so I am shifting the second stream from Friday back to Thursday, which is kind of what we were doing before, but the school schedules were kind of getting in the way. Um, but either way, so we're expecting to do Hibbit on Thursday. Uh, and then this is the the kind of short list of how i'm looking at the streams thereafter um though it's not necessarily a super hard list but i am already looking at um Ac academy sports and uh, sleep number which are the next two on the list i'm already kind of like taking a look at that but either way we'll get into uh build a bear workshop um and all the numbers i have for that just give me one second to check something over here Stream settings. So anyway, um, with Build a Bear, I did kind of put together a little bit of a revenue model based off of what I think about their store growth for uh, the next five years, which we'll get into after I go through all the numbers. I have put in all the the numbers for the one year already, as I normally do. Um, taking a look at their segmentations, they have a direct consumer segmentation as well as a commercial segmentation. So it's mostly just their retail business as well as their um, kind of potential online retails that they also do. As well as the commercials, more like selling some of their products to other businesses to be sold on store shelves. And then international, which is kind of a function of both of those. Um, either way, I end up with an unlevered beta of 1.09. Uh, we'll see what that looks like after adjusting for their, their actual uh, leverage that they have for the company itself a sales capital ratio for the industry of 2.99 and a net margin of 5.81 uh, they do have a pretty strong sales capital ratio not quite as strong as the industrial expectation um, but the most recent year margin has been much better than the industrial expectation though again that's one of the things where we're gonna have to adjust our expectations about what we think will happen with uh, those earnings in the future because they did have particularly good uh, years in the last two years so we'll see what we think in uh, terms of kind of weighing all those things together. Um, in terms of geographic uh, segmentation, 86% of the revenues comes from the U.S. while they have 93% of their assets in the U.S. So that we've affected their, their equity risk premium for that. And they do have $98.5 million in debt at a weighted average maturity of four years and 6% interest rate, which is basically just their lease liabilities. They don't have any actual normal debt. Um, but either way, so that comes up to a pretty small amount of debt relative to the market cap, not a, a tiny amount, but it shouldn't mean that they're, they're uh, their levered beta shouldn't be terrible once we lever it all the way up, but we'll see what that comes out to be. Uh, so I will go ahead and start uh, the uh, fourth quarter call while I work. Greetings. Welcome to the Builder Bear Workshop Investor Presentation Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question all right. will follow the formal presentation. You may submit questions via the web at any time by using the Ask a Question feature on the side of your screen. Get okay, into some of numbers. Zero on your telephone keypad. Please note this conference is being recorded. 
Yeah, so 2021 revenues of 401 million versus 255 in the year prior to that. Though it was down from 338 the year prior to that. So definitely some volatility. Through a PowerPoint presentation and then questions and answers with management. As a reminder, this is not a quarterly earnings call, and our purpose is to give a high level, broad overview of the business. The discussion is going to be led by CEO Sharon John, who is also joined on the call by Vlon Todorik, CFO. You should see the presentation through the webcast. If you'd like a copy, simply email me at glen, G L E N, at bristolir.com. We will break for Q&A at the end of the formal presentation. When we do break, we encourage questions. And as a reminder, we're only taking questions through the web portal. If you're listening over the phone, please access the web link from earlier to ask a question. Remember, you can submit that question at any time. I'll ask the question on the air for everyone to hear, and then the management team will answer. I'm not going to reference... Yeah, even if this business does come in as overvalued right now, I do think it's a pretty... Uh, interesting niche to look at just because of the fact that it's experiential um, no other business is quite like it so even like close competitors are uh, pretty far off so even if it's expensive right now it would be a really good company to pay attention to I think for the long run uh, whenever an opportunity could show up but who knows maybe it will still be undervalued today Thank you, Glenn, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining us today. We look forward to walking you through uh, um, our strategies and, and some of our results um, and being able to answer some of your questions toward the end of the meeting. Um, many of you may know that Build-A-Bear Workshop was formed in 1997, and when it was formed, it was um, a mall-based experiential specialty retailer where children and their families could create their own stuffed animals. Well, that was just the beginnings of Build-A-Bear, and over the last nearly 25 years, Build-A-Bear has become a brand with high consumer awareness and positive affinity, and we've now sold over 200 million furry friends that have been made by our guests around the world. That impact allows the company to leverage its brand strength, and that's what we've been doing, and that's what we're planning to share with you is some of the outcomes of the strategy of that strategic leveraging to evolve our brick and mortar retail footprint beyond traditional malls, creating hey, yeah, a versatile up? range of formats and locations that include tourist destinations, that where we've been able to extend our consumer base beyond kids to include teens and adults with entertainment and sports licensing, collectibles and gifting. The company is also significantly advanced. See, they built up their inventories in the last year, like most everybody else. Meaningful growth in e-commerce and our omni-channel business. That's either a good thing or a terrible thing. It relates <laughs> right back to that Build-A-Bear pop culture and multi-generational appeal. And we will walk you through a lot of those initiatives today. Used up a decent amount of their that have come rights of use assets. That's interesting. Those, um, over the last few years. Uh, the first slide, page four highlights much of what I just said and gives you some real data on the impact that we've had, whether that's from uh, the evolution of our omni-channel capabilities, we're now nearly 40% of our retail sales are e-com, uh, that we've now diversified our portfolio of stores, where 35% of our stores are now not located in that traditional mall location. Um, nearly, we have nearly 500 locations globally, inclusive of international locations that are franchised, uh, and 40% of our sales are now to teens, tweens, and adults. That is highly impacted by this deep and extensive long-term licensing relationship with 75 different, over 75 different licenses with best-in-class partners, and some data here about um, the brand power. Um, and we have a multitude of uh, data points where we can see how low their uh, retained earnings are and that they grew pretty solidly this year. We'll have to uh, see what the so trend of the negativeness of that in the past was. We are a profitable business. In fact, we ended 2021 um, what am I forgetting? it being the most profitable year in the company's nearly 25 year history and revenues of $411.5 million. Um, we have um, good cash flow, 
uh, and we have a very solid balance sheet. Um, we do have not only that powerful brand, but what's really interesting about that is we leverage and um, strategize. A bit uncertain on that one. Opportunity. I'm already selling a little bit of it, but it's stores. not because of, right of valuation right reasons. Guys. It's just because, uh, like I said, I took on extra exposure. Uh, so now I'm unwinding it a little bit, but it's very slow. Um, I was trying to take a look at it as, as a more of a closer valuation standalone, trying to figure out what I think, but it's difficult. I don't think I'm going to do any serious unloading until the next quarter comes out and I can get an idea of what the balance sheet looks like post close. But either way, I will be uh, selling portions of my T and WBD positions just to prep for that. Which would be almost nine years ago now for me, or about nine years ago and eight years ago for Voin. And we've been on this road of diversification and diversifying that business model to be able to participate fairly in the digital economy and become an omni-channel company uh, and that we believe over the last two years particularly has been accelerated with our digital transformation um, through the the covid environment mm. and okay. our ability to have built the created the building blocks over the prior years to then leverage and lean in to the power of the brand and that's only done with an accomplished team um, and now we are very well prepared uh, for continued profitable growth uh, from an expectations perspective. Um, we are also, as I led, um, looking at our 25th anniversary and we'll be celebrating that throughout the year. You get a sense on page six of what our timeline is on that. Page eight, um, this is some metrics as I re referred to on the power of the brand. We do have a lot of first party data our brand awareness and distinctive numbers, affinity numbers, rival a lot of top brands uh, in the consumer, uh, kids, particularly kids consumer space. And we have about 60% of our store visits are planned and about a third of our business is about birthdays. And the reason we like to share that is one that provides leverage for us. She took 30 million in WBD. Negotiations perspective from a lease. That's interesting. In that consumers choose to come to build a bear. And secondly, a lot of times there's an assumption of a very fourth quarter skewed seasonality for something that might be retail and toy combined. But that birthday business actually balances out um, our seasonality. On page nine, you'll get a sense of the. Uh, the fact that we are a, a really have a balanced, highly co coveted consumer base, um, children driven, of course, except you know we are, as we noted, building out that business with new consumers or the end user is teens and tweens, uh, but that, that higher than average socioeconomic strata is also very good. Yeah, please uh, do. I would definitely um, be curious to see that. Build a bear, uh, and. I've never really thought much about uh, Oprah's wealth, but she does have a decent amount of it. I don't know what her net worth is like, but I imagine 30 million is a decent chunk of it. What does she have? Is she like 1 billion or something? 2 billion maybe? I don't know. Maybe I'm overshooting. Maybe she's only like half a billion or something. I don't know. I have no idea how rich Oprah is. <laughs> Of driving maybe she's only got like families and children 100 million or maybe that's her entire net worth is actually over in i feel like she's a billionaire right because she's done like a bunch of businesses and stuff but. And gift giving business so both of the sides of our retail business have a very specific objective and we work to drive that business ultimately we do gather first party data and we also recognize that the generation of increased lifetime value is founded many times in having them shop in store and then shop online or have an experience online and come in store. So it's a completely integrated approach that we've been doing that has been driving value for us. Yeah, I could have sworn she was a billionaire. Of the brand I didn't think it was a value. huge amount, but 2.5. And that value 2 is beyond our ability, although important, to create these relationships with powerful licenses, that value also comes in the package of getting a lot of media and a lot of press. You can see on page 11, this is just a small sliver of the type of impact that Build-A-Bear generates. 
I'll point out one uh, is the Baby Yoda, um, the Baby Yoda impact that we had that generated over a billion impressions in a single week. And you may recall, which isn't Baby in Yoda. This particular sheet, um, just recently with Valentine's, we generated another billion uh, impression experience with our After Dark program through that was sold through the Bear Cave, which is a new space on our, an age-gated space on our uh, website. Again, focusing on and targeting that teen and adult consumer. We're regularly in pop culture, uh, just embedded and in, 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 into the... I did think it was interesting when I was reading their 10K, because uh, they, like I was saying, they don't really have any competitors that actually have something similar to this, um, but the competitors that they do list in their 10K were basically talking about the uh, other experiential stuff like Valentine's, uh, chocolates, other things like that. Um, there is a setting to lower the stream latency. I mean, I have it at normal latency. Um, and you can lower it. Hold on a second. I think I'd have to restart the stream to do that, but I'll, I'll reset it after because of that relationship. After today. Some examples of that are in gaming, like I could have sworn I used to have it on low. I don't know why it's on normal now. I never because there's there's three settings on the on YouTube. There's normal latency, low latency, and ultra low. I was pretty sure I used to have it on low. I don't know why it's on normal now. In the bear cave, for example, a matrix bear um, or Deadpool bear. I'll switch that um, after today. On page uh, 14, you can also see that we then, because of that high awareness and that emotional attachment, we do create tremendous loyalty. And some of the efforts in our digital transformation in recent years are about evolving that loyalty program, evolving our strategies, our CRM data, growing that CRM data, Amen. and creating a dynamic way for us to communicate and engage with our guests on a regular basis to drive sales. Wait that brings us to digging in a little more up, into I? the omni-channel revenue model. Um, and you'll see that that's based on, if you reference page 16, it's based on this idea of a continuous circle of engagement. Our basic construct is that we put the consumer as an important part, obviously, of who, of who we are as a brand, but that we believe that they can enter the brand at any point and can re-engage with the brand if we, when we create a great relationship, a great memory, um, we can then extend that lifetime value over time. So retail is one way to enter the brand. That often does create that first step of having a, a lot for our particular Yeah, I just realized I was doing the wrong line here. But as we start to build out new revenue streams, um, whether that's in you know the, our entertainment areas, or our content creation areas, or our outbound license areas, that's another way to enter the brand that then may get them to come to the store. So there's this ongoing creation of value that we're able to generate. Um, and that has led to profitability. Um, profitable not just our stores, but our e-commerce business, and which has been translated into, again, the most profitable year in the history of the company. Some specifics related to that, um, we have been very focused over the past seven, no, eight, no, nine no, no, no. years on the evolution of our retail formats and footprints to lead no. us to have more leverage, um, a lot more latitude in the way we set up our leases so that we have flexibility in those lease structures, as well as to assure that we are building and driving toward a profitable store fleet. Um, and over the past few years, um, we have elevated that effort to a place where 97% of our corporately managed stores in North America are now prof profitable with over 25% average store contribution. Um, and um, we continue to focus on that and work hard on that. And as we mentioned in our most recent earnings call, with that, we believe there's significantly more potential. Okay, for there we go. There, even in that. Now hopefully, I can. Space. 
not do the wrong year again. It's going to take too long if I do that over and over again. That means that we believe that the experience of build a bear, which is break frame in and to itself, and often credited for creating experiential retail in some in some fashion, um, we believe that we have continued opportunities to open stores in the right location, because that iconic hands-on experience does build that emotional connection to the brand, which is then what we're leveraging again to build ongoing value and build into new and diversified revenue streams. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, I don't know why I didn't connect it to the fact that she ha herself has content production. That makes sense. Have now allowed us to move into a repost from 2020. Areas, and we'll highlight that in just a moment on the types of physical well, locations that we now are able to profitably. If she held, she, uh, um, I think she'd be doing all right. Stay focused on the fact that we believe that an important part of this model is the retail stores and the retail store experience. Um, that provides us with the ongoing ability okay. to leverage the, the power and monetize the brand equity over time. We have expanded into a number of global locations, which you see on page 19. And as I referenced earlier, as an example of some of the things that we're doing, even to diversify the experiences on e-com in our digital area, you'll see the Bear Cave as one of those offerings. So on page 20, what we've done on buildabear.com, again, is this is an example of the recognition that we have different types of consumers who have different types of needs when they're shopping online. Our primary objective, as I noted before, from a consumer perspective, is the older consumer that's more likely engaged or involved in gifting or licensing. And we've created sub brands and places for them to go that might look a little different or there's bundles available for them to purchase that make it a more seamless type of interaction, often mobile first, um, and certainly they want it to be as frictionless as possible. But at the same time, we do have um, some uh, children with over the shoulder mom going through our e-commerce experience and we create experiences that are more like the store for them. That's exemplified by the Bear Builder or Bear Builder 3D, which we recently launched. It is a virtual reimagined store experience where the furry friend actually comes to life on screen while you're going through the process. Um, and then we- Either awesome or creepy, not sure which. Which is a gifting procured box, um, box bear with other products such as candles or tea or cups that are designed to wish someone a happy birthday or happy anniversary or happy Valentine's Day. So when you look at our online shopping experiences and engagement, we are purposefully creating these sub brands to appeal to different types of consumer groups because we recognize through our research and data that these different types of consumer groups see Build-A-Bear in different ways. So we're meeting their needs. Ultimately, that entire digital uh, transformation that we've been going through that touches many, many parts of the business All beyond right. e-commerce. One more year and we can do a little bit of a, a growing and short term five year platform. trend analysis. And that was a critical objective for the company and remains incredibly important to us. You'll see that we now have over $70 million in revenue um, and that uh, we've seen that a 34, over actually it's over 34% CAGR since 2016, since we really started to rebuild that entire website. And we still have opportunity con to, to continue to rebuild, reskin, reimagine the website, as well as our loyalty program, which we mentioned in the last call that we expect to upgrade and update uh, in the course of 2020. One second. Um, some of the data. Seeing uh, this that, whole uh, row is like off the line. Underlying fundamentals of this growth. 
um, is we see positive site traffic trends of plus 30. I don't know how that happened, but um, increased unique visitors. Glad I caught it. Um, our on site average um, of 4.2 million per month. Um, we are in partnership with best in class partners from a technology and expansion of digital capabilities effect, uh, perspective, Salesforce, namely. Um, we are doing on yeah welcome aboard y'all subscribe if you're not already please different types of consumers much appreciated 22 you can see I see the, the couple likes I like it thank um, y'all that again are contributing to the overall profitable growth of our e-commerce business Stay a while with a 97 percent increase in digital transactions from new guests and a list down the down the left side of the presentation of different Areas We've been doing really good on views in the last uh, couple weeks and subscribers as well. We're up to 92. Engagement, whether that's digital it's pretty awesome. From op, uh, last guest, opted in email list, digital traffic, e-commerce driven by our advertising, um, increased impressions, or even Google searches, which is really a metric uh, that is related greatly to the power of the brand. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Voin to... To, uh, review include asset impairment but not the deferred taxes because we're doing a post expanded from uh, equity cash flow perspective thanks Sharon and on slide 23 you can see that uh, we have as a company developed multiple range of formats that helped us be in a variety of different locations and really that drove our diversification away from traditional malls and you can see that like a lot of our uh, initiatives over the last several years were to like move away and open more stores in tourist locations where we over indexed on a lot of key metrics. Uh, we had some stores with all right now, just the balance sheet, and we'll do that five year trend. We created this uh, concourse model where in 200 square feet uh, within the concourse of a mall, you can have a full Build a Bear experience, variety of seasonal shops and events from boats to uh, NFL experiences, Gaylord seasonal hotels. We are there where people are going for fun and entertainment, and we are continuing to evolve that model. Um, our corporately managed stores, we have close to about 350 of those. Last year in 21, 99 of those American stores were profitable with 28% with average EBITDA as horrible EBITDA as percentage of sales. Thanks, man. Uh, I very much appreciate you always being here to participate. With, uh, almost 12 different partners. I appreciate the, the, the three or four of you that are pretty much always here. To them on a wholesale basis, and you can still get a full Build-A-Bear experience. This is an asset light model for us. We provide training, support, uh, but you know we get more of that wholesale revenue from them. And also, uh, we do have international franchise model currently in uh, eight different countries with over 70 locations. As we think about okay. our store fleet, we believe that- All right, so we'll go ahead and pause the, the call. North America. Sorry, Mr. Tudorvik, uh, apparently that's his name. Uh, so we'll take a look at the five-year trend. Yeah, all the OGs. Oh, hey, Jack, what's up? Uh, so if we're looking at the sales and capital ratio, you can see it's a little bit all over the place What with a solid dip in 2019 uh, and in 2020. Interesting to see that it was in 2019, not in 2020, that they had that dip. But either way, over the entire five-year period, it's pretty solid in about 2.61 as an average, 1.9 for the most recent three years. So we can maybe use that three-year uh, period as our starting base, but we'd work more towards like the five or six period. But hey, Scott, man, geez, all, all of the, the gang showing up uh, right now. Uh, Oh, the gang's all here. Uh, let's take a look at the the shareholders' equity. Uh, I, as I was saying before, I was curious to see if the retained earnings were going to be negative in some of these previous years. I couldn't remember doing that in some of the prep work, and it didn't show up here so far. Maybe it'll be the case in the previous years before that, but I guess that was just a dip due to the loss that they were taking in 2020. Uh, it was just kind of a, uh, a thought that I had as I was doing the numbers. But in fact, you can see that actually the shareholders' equity is uh, decreasing over this shorter period of time, but it is just barely. Uh, with the liabilities increasing pretty significantly, actually almost doubling the assets, not really doubling, but increasing. So you can definitely see where the, the drop in the equity came from. I do like that they don't have a whole bunch of cash on hand. Uh, on one hand, you want to have a bunch of cash on hand. They had, and they have enough cash for maybe a year's worth of loss or, or two, uh, but it does mean that they are keeping a lot of the, the cash well uh, invested. 
Uh, not yet, man, but we're working on it. We're working on it. I certainly try to operate my portfolio a little bit like, like a hedge fund does in some ways, but I obviously can't uh, do all of the things that, uh, that a hedge fund certainly can. Uh, anyway, taking a look at the current assets, you can see that it's grown a little bit over time with the current liabilities. It's definitely a pretty good balance between the two. Um, the overall courage ratio has decreased a little bit over the, the five year period. So that's something perhaps to worry about that they could start to build up their receivables versus their inventories in not such a great way. Return on equity is pretty solid for the years that it's positive. But obviously, you can see it's pretty chaotic over the five year period uh, with the returns on invested capital somewhat similar. We have two negative years in there and then one year that's relatively flat. But then we also have uh, close to 30% and then also in double digits 11% over a five year period if we just take that full average it comes out to 1.63 which includes the negative so pretty low in terms of that but again that has to do partially with the, the volatility of the business in actually good years it does come out pretty good uh, I can also argue that they're doing a decent amount of their capital investment through the form of the change in working capital so the overall movement of receivables and inventory is actually almost a larger part of their capital expenditures than the actual capex uh, which you do see for a lot of retail type businesses that's pretty typical um so that, that could be part of the issue is that they were building up a lot of uh a lot of uh current assets relative to the overall property and plant equipment so you can look at the margins over the five year period with three years it was about one percent five years it's about zero percent so yeah pretty pretty much no margins if you're looking at over a five-year period it really just comes down to looking at profitable years like 2021 where they get this close to 12 percent uh, number and thinking about whether or not that's going to sustain itself over the long run So that has to do partially again with the the overall variability in the revenues as I did say at the start of the stream I did build a pretty simple revenue model based off of store openings and closings as well as profitability uh, per square footage in the Those stores. So we'll get into that when I cover all of the numbers uh, once I'm done with all ten uh, So I will start the call back up for anybody who's watching that has a dirty uh, like the stream, please do like the stream. It'd be very much appreciated. Or if you haven't already subscribed, that would also be appreciated. Though I have a feeling uh, perhaps all of you are subscribed. Maybe maybe one of you is, I'm not sure. Our biggest market. Uh, we have plans to add 15 to 20 locations over the next couple of years in North America through a combination of these corporately managed and third party retail locations. Uh, strong profitability that that I mentioned definitely allow us to fund some of that expansion and really help support drive some of that digital demand to our 300 plus locations that we often refer to as mini distribution centers and fulfilling this growth and demand that Sharon talked about that representing roughly 20% of our business compared to 4% uh, just several years ago. Uh, we also have done a good job as the organization managing our lease optionality. We have over 70% of our leases coming up for renewal over the next three years. And that gives us tremendous amount of power in our negotiations with landlords. And we are one of those companies that is driving traffic to the most. We have a high percentage of our... Yeah, I can concur with what he's saying right there. As we were talking about with the debt profile, it's about a four-year weighted average maturity, and all of their debt is actually lease liabilities. We are opening a build a Bear Adventure store that's going to have a... Um, as far as the 10 year trend that I'm looking at, it doesn't seem to be a, a super huge change in revenues. And really full build a bear experience. So we are excited about that. In addition to that, as we mentioned, we have new vending machines, automated steady machines or ATMs as we See, like, uh, refer to them. That's another way for us to be in places where I don't have the the revenues up here, but this is this total numbers of stores that they had in North America. Um, in North America is the vast majority of their business. Uh, in 2012, 2013, 2014, uh, through here, and you can see like in the most recent years they have more stores open. So I don't. I'm pretty sure they have higher revenues now than they did in 2012. But we'll see when we get back there. Where I mean, you may not have a core competency look, on the product line itself. 380 so million in 2012, uh, 379 in 2013. Or um, bicycles or other products um, where Build-A-Bear is paid a margin rich royalty revenue uh, and it places the brand in thousands of additional He's stores, holding a second. Um, and increases the presence of the brand. We refer to this as outbound licensing. Um, as which is to differentiate it from our license to a uh, 
company like a Disney to be able to sell. Just realize I have a mistake in my. For some reason, I have the income statement listed twice here rather than the cash flow statement right here. Hold on. Lean into creating and elevating emotional connections through content creation and storytelling. It's a great part of our engagement strategy. It's also an important part of what is now the new marketing strategy. Uh, traditional advertising to children uh, has the, the, the entire approach to that, tactical approach to that has evolved enormously over the past few years. The creation of this type of marketing approach has been very good for us to be able to uh, create that emotional connective tissue back to our brand and our sub brands like Honey Girls, for example, which has is a recent movie that we launched in conjunction with Sony Worldwide Pictures Acquisitions um, and is now available on net, uh, Netflix. Um, and I'll turn it over to Voin for some quick financials and then we'll get to the questions. So really quick, uh, on 2021 uh, was our most profitable year uh, and definitely some... There we go. Had to fix that you can see on the spreadsheet slide, real briefly. Uh, versus 2020 and probably even more importantly versus 2019 that was the last full year before COVID. Uh, over 21, almost 22 percent growth in total revenues. Our pre-tax income of just shy of 51 million was the uh, record in company's history and it's almost 50 million more than what we had in 2019. Uh, strong profit margins about 53 percent. 760 basis points improvement compared to 2019. Cash and cash equivalent, about $33 million, and that reflects some of the capital allocation that was done um, in late in Q4. We did a, uh, $20 million, basically, in one-time special dividend, and we announced a share repurchase program uh, in the amount of $25 million. Uh, the next slide, slide 29, highlights some of the key metrics, um, as Sharon pointed out, since we got here uh, now many years ago, we did see a big transformation uh, that was led by the current management team and a broader leadership team that uh, was all brought in. Uh, our total revenue from 384 to 411 has gone, even though there was turmoil in the overall retail environment and decline in more business and more traffic, we were able to really improve our profitability to a tune of 85 million in EBITDA from a loss of 25 million in 2012. Our digital demand, as, as we pointed out, from 4% to almost 20%. Uh, North America stores being profitable, as I pointed out. These metrics, of, we had about 80% uh, of the stores in North America that were profitable, but the contribution margin on the four wall EBIT basis was less than 10%. That now the 97% with over 25% of the margin. Online. Jesus. We diversified from traditional mall locations. Uh, and our average dollars per transaction versus 2012 has gone up over 50%, and it's in most recent year about $53. If, um, if we can just take a quick skip to page 34, we'll, we'll, we'll pop over the um, COVID response. Um, although it is an interesting read, <laughs> I encourage you to take a look at that. But um, I think just to focus on some of our plans to continue this uh, road of profitable growth in 2022 and beyond, we're not significantly shifting our strategy because our strategy is working. So um, it is a three-pronged approach that we have uh, uh, that we have shared. Um, of leveraging our ongoing and continuing to accelerate actually our digital transformation to drive growth. Um, and that is a focus on this lifetime value expansion uh, and the page 34 of, our addressable market of the 10K. Um, and the use of digital is that what you're talking about? content to drive that, continue to drive that brand awareness. Um, leveraging our omni-channel uh, omni capabilities and evolving our retail experiences and, and footprint. Um, Wayne shared with you uh, some of those initiatives on uh, that from that perspective. Are you talking about something else? So we expect to use our stores as a conduit to 
capitalize on our 25th anniversary celebration this year. Um, oh, I wasn't quite listening to what she was saying there for a minute. I was kind of focusing on the numbers a little bit. Maybe she was talking about taxes. I'm not sure. Incremental sales and visits during that year. Um, we are, we have actually at this point reintroduced birthday parties um, in conjunction with our 25th birthday. We haven't had birthday parties because of COVID, COVID in, uh, induced um, uh, challenges. Um, in the Don't mess with me, man. I'm, I'm like autistic like that. I'll go straight to the page. You're like, page 34? I got it right here. <laughs> let me, let me pull it right up. Uh, and across we all sorts of uh, environments where we can engage and elevate the relationship with our guests. Um, and as Roy noted, um, continuing to let I will say I do uh, judge CEOs quite a lot on like the way they um, deliver information uh, and how forthright they are with things um, and how confident they they sound in the things they say. I do I do think she sounds like a pretty solid CEO at first listen. It's just kind of like a first impression type thing. Definitely nothing solid, but I don't know much about her. Initiatives that we're sharing and a lot of excitement in the corporation around a lot of these initiatives. She is pretty forthright. Inclusive of the Build a Bear Adventure, which we recently launched, which is a brand new approach to an expanded, leveled up experience for guests. Um, and of course, as we noted, um, the continued driving of across a number of fronts that consumer relationship marketing and database uh, across uh, gifting, collectibles, and our traditional bear building process. The next few pages highlight our leadership and board. And I believe, in summary, it's that we and this is on page oh next few years. pages you know we're profitable business with strong margins great you know we're great um yes ma'am gotta keep up strong brand connecting on a global basis with millions of consumers we believe that we're now with so much of the groundwork done building blocks in place a strategy that is showing uh, success that we're in a position uh, for further advancement and establishing um, a broader consumer segment Big buyback against a diversified in 2015. Model, different reasons for consumers to shop and engage with Build-A-Bear. Uh, and we're looking forward to continuing to drive profitable growth with this accomplished and seasoned leadership team. <laughs> yeah. I gotta say, I was uh, I was talking to one of my roommates uh, about this because I was like, I was like, you know, uh, the stream I'm planning to do on Monday because they know what I do. Uh, I was like, I, I'm planning on doing Build a Bear workshop, and I was trying to do some research for the company, and I ended up googling uh, BBW dot IR looking for their investor relations page, and I gotta say, that was a mistake. That was a big mistake. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we are very proud of our culture, actually. Um, so we love to talk about it. Our mission. I felt kind of hesitant, almost putting the BBW in the in the title too. I was like, you know, this is either a great idea or a terrible one. The corporate headquarters, which we call the Bear Quarters, to the Bear House, which is the warehouse. We clearly have our own culture, our own language, um, and you know, we we pride ourselves on our engagement at the store level. The bear builders, the managers are often given credit as they should okay. for being the team that is the one-to-one -one relationship with our most important entity, which is our guest. Um, we value the fact and honor that we have this opportunity to make people <laughs> smile every day. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually seen a research paper done on uh, the effect of choosing uh, recognizable ticker names on on stock performance. Uh, and it definitely it definitely seems to create a bias towards retail investors when you have a recognizable uh, ticker name, any kind of recognizable ticker name. Uh, 
but ultimately we're here like even something like like hood for robin hood or something you know more heart to life is that our job is that we're making every day a it doesn't have to be uh somebody that comes dirty or risque or anything um, <laughs> and that means whether they come to work or they go to the store or they go on our line online or they're packing a box in our bear house and I'll give you a really good example of that. Well, one, we've, we've been on multiple best places to work with over the years. We actually were also given uh, the, an award for that through um, Forbes most recently. Um, but as an example, without prompt, um, our warehouse, before they do their bear building stuffing process every day for the e-commerce orders, they on their own have the heart ceremony um, each morning before they start that process. Uh, and that just gives you a, a really good sense of how much we permeate the importance of what we do every day into this company. Not to mention the Build-A-Bear Foundation, which gives both in-kind and, um, and actual money to multiple charities with the interest of um, children's health and well-being each year. Perfect. Thank you for that, Jay. Uh, next question is, how have you achieved 25% store contribution? How does that compare to previous peak levels, mall retail tiers, and your expectations? And proportionally, how much Let's of see how we're doing on the call time. Years with some better we got like 23 minutes left on the call. Yeah, so um, over the last uh, several years, you've been, we've been working, you know, that uh, to achieve this high four wall contribution margins, as we said, over 25%. And again, this is the average of basically the entire fleet. Uh, how does it compare? You know, again, there is some seasonality, you know, by years and different things that we have had. But uh, prior to us coming, as I was one data point in 2012, we were under 10%. So what has happened during that same time frame? We have uh, spent enormous amount of time expanding our merchandise, mar merchandise margin. Our merchandise margin during that same time frame improved uh, just shy of 1,000 basis points. Uh, we did um, renegotiate a lot of our leases and work with our landlords, and uh, uh, that definitely helped. As I well. made it. But, you know, we managed our merchandise. That's why it's kind of a, occupancy cost a little bit of a jumbled mess. I've been meaning to try to... Put some time aside to build a new template from the ground up to try to make it a little bit cleaner uh, and better to look at for for the users for, for you guys and the viewers uh and like i, I want to make a template that's good enough that i feel comfortable sharing it with other people but right now the one i currently have is uh kind of tricky to use if you don't understand everything in it i mean that's true of most uh excel templates in general I generally recommend people like I know that you can find templates from from lots of people out there, but it's generally better if you just learn to use Excel yourself, because otherwise it can be tricky to understand why you're getting the results you're getting. Significant changes, and I think we showed in some of the charts. But yeah, I made I made this in in the document in the prepared document, but of what this. It's like the latest iteration of several. This is like my. My 3.0 template. I've uh, I've made several versions along the way, and I kind of evolve it with each step and add new things and take out other things and correct things. But um, but I started in 20. It definitely needs some upgrading though. Uh, and to give you some of those comparisons, um, Oops, something's wrong here. We referenced our digital demand this year in 2021 year in with over 70 million dollars, with a penetration of nearly 20 percent of net retail sales. That's compared to what was $14 million in 2012 and a 4% of net retail. Our merch margin has increased 950 basis points compared to 2012, even with some pandemic challenges and supply chain disruptions. As we noted, that 97% of our North American stores were profitable uh, and with a 25% contribution margin. That's compared to... 20% of all locations um, being unprofitable well, in 20 Well, partially just because I've learned more sheets than Excel, um, um, but that's because I kind of just chose it from the start. Uh, and uh, in that I like I like Google Sheets because it has the Google Finance functions. Uh, so like I can type the ticker BBW right here, and then I can type equals Google Finance. 
right here and then select that ticker and it'll automatically pull up the the price uh and things like that there's and the, there's a bunch of applications of this function and you can use right here that's what i have going on up here uh and so you can pull real live price data into into the excel spreadsheet just by doing this i can i can switch the ticker the reason we decided and it just to reloads the, the another price there uh, and Excel has similar things to that, um, but they're a little different. And I just personally found that Google's was better for those types of things. Uh, and it's also integrated with Google Drive, which is where I keep all my spreadsheets. Uh, there is obviously uh, Microsoft in OneDrive, but I prefer Google Drive over OneDrive as well. So that's the reason I use Google. But you can do basically all the same stuff in Excel. Um, in fact, there's probably some things in Excel you can't do in Google, just like there's probably some things in Google you can't do in Excel. So there, there's benefits to both. I just, yeah, yeah, Google, I think it's just a little bit better for auto updating stuff. Um, but there is some stuff that Excel does that, that Google doesn't have too. Uh, Excel is way better with graphs and charts, for example. If, if you want to make graphs and charts with with stuff, there's like way more options in Excel than Google. So they each have their benefits. Profitable growth for the company. Because I have to use Excel for school a lot. Um, uh, but I learned Google when I was just kind of teaching myself. What you're seeing with regard to the health of the consumer, how sensitive do you think the business is? All right, so last two years. Hopefully we can get through I'll start some of these. with that in that, you know, throughout the uh, 2019 into 2020, of course, we had some blips in there with our entire fleet oh, being oops, shut down, on. but a lot of that did drive our e-commerce business to shift in consumer shopping habits. Um, and then into 2021, we've seen... A, a not only yeah, and see that's the thing. Once you start using one more than the other, it's very hard to shift. And like, so that's part of the reason I say it's like I use Google because I started using Google, and so it's hard to shift over to Excel. Uh, but I I use Excel for school, uh, and I actually really hope that I can get those skills kind of equal with each other because it would be really really nice to be able to switch over between each other because they're very similar, but they do have a lot of little differences. Uh, so yeah. But there's definitely things about Excel that are way better than Sheets, just like there are things about Sheets that are better than Excel. Uh, so it's like Sheets is just better integrated with everything else Google does, uh, while Excel is older and has worked through a lot of the kinks of, of a lot of its like plugins and stuff a lot better too. So that's like another benefit Excel has. How discretionary is a teddy bear? You know, there, there. We've seen in the past that the toy industry can be comparatively protected from some of these situations. But I would also offer that it's not that you don't celebrate the child's birthday in a, even in a recession or a inflationary time period. And then, not to mention, Sheets is also free. So, and hopefully, Build a Bear would be a part of that selection set. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned all the transformation you've done over the past few years that led to your recent strong results. Were there also external factors that contributed to the success, such as COVID behavior at Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, there was a lot of work that was done internally, and, you know, there were things and both tailwinds and headwinds that we had from the external environment. Uh, some of those uh, challenges that we can see that we have experienced so from uh, uh, declining mall traffic to uh, COVID pandemic to Brexit, we also looked at the opportunities and a lot of good things came out as a result of those events. So, for example, with the decline in mall traffic, we were diversifying in all these different formats that I mentioned during our presentation and really increase the flexibility for us to operate in places where people were moving to go for fun and entertainment because those places historically were malls, but now people are, there are just many more choices. When we think about even the COVID pandemic, uh, even though our stores were uh, closed for a period of time, there was a much bigger focus on e-com and technology during that time, and we accelerated some of the investments during uh, those difficult times that really helped us and enable us to drive that digital demand and use our 
resourceful as fulfillment centers and really to help um, fulfill this tremendous growth and demand as well as to shorten that time frame between um, the order and uh, the time the guest is getting um, uh, the final product because having one sale point from our warehouse in Ohio to be distributing all these eco motors we have like much more flexible model so again there were challenges we use those challenges as opportunities and you know same thing with brexit and challenges in uk uh in recent year in 21 even though they had to deal with COVID and everything else uh, our business there is very strong we are continuing to look at ways to improve and we are seeing continued strong growth both in us and in uk and and continue to see uh, uh growth in our uh, digital demand Okay, thank you. Um, how have the collectibles, gift, and adult revenues trended in recent years? What percentage of revenue were there? Right, one more year to go. 40%. So we have not specified the collectibles gifting as a different segment, but what we have specified is the consumer, di the, the, the consumer demographics as a specific. So. Uh, I would 2015, 2014, the teen, tween, and adult business was more about 25% of the total business, yeah. and now it's about 40% of the business. And that gives you some directional information about how important the expansion into some of these giftables and, collect and collectibles and affinity products have been for us because they certainly, that old consumer over indexes on those types of purchases. Thank you. Um, can you please discuss your capital allocation strategy? Twenty-nine. Means for growth, share repurchases, dividends. It's gonna be thirty at the end of the month. Uh, of course, uh, definitely we are pleased uh, with the management of our financials and our disciplined approach through some of the very challenging times, especially during COVID. Um, and you know we came out on the other side of the healthy, clean balance sheet. And at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we did spend um, about $20 million in special dividends uh, that was declared um, late last year. We also are board outright $25 million share repurchase program that at the time of our last earnings call, we spent about $5 million uh, against. So we continue to look at ways to uh, return share uh, value to our shareholders, uh, looking for ways from the return on investment and like what may be the best payback. Uh, we are also uh, making investment in our business. We guided for this year that our CapEx is expected to be 10 to $15 million. We expect to add 15 to 20 new locations. All right, final balance sheet. Invest in our and information. then we can so do some projections. Right balance between all these things. We do have a full, uh, availability under our credit facility. We have asset baseline in the amount of $25 million. So we are well funded and you know, we continue to look at best ways to return money yeah. to shareholders and continue to- That's right. Trajectory that we have in place. Okay, thank you for that. Let's see. Can you talk about the repurchase? 27th, 27th is my birthday. So, uh, so yeah, y'all better show up on the, on the 28th to, to be throwing in a whole bunch of likes. That's all. That's all I want for for my birthday. So one thing is a whole bunch of likes. Oh, go ahead, Glenn. I, I want record views that day. I mean, what did you, Glenn? Did you I, I think ask just some repeat business. Repeat business. So uh, one of the things that uh, again a little bit unique with our uh, consumer base, we do have what we refer to as a leaky bucket because every year we have a portion of kids that age out. And, but every year you are kind of replacing with new kids. Um, so what's really happening there is due to the nature of the business and the kids' information that we can track. Usually their parents or grandparents are signing for some of the loyalty programs and rewards, and that's how we are tracking these individuals. So um, from that aspect, we are a little bit unique, but we All right. really are working it, on some that's of the it. To Let's go ahead and uh, cut that call. Pretty good. Let's go ahead and take a look at all 10 of our years. 
starting at the sales capital ratio as we typically do. So if we go back further than the five years into the past, you can see the sales capital ratio was even higher. That's pretty crazy to see. Uh, they're dealing with obviously a much lower capital base and much higher revenues. It might have been, it might have been a factor of them their business growing pretty solidly through uh, through the past end of the decade and they having a low capital base and therefore these being revenues that kind of came back and then they had to maybe back end some of this uh, the expense with it essentially they're maybe getting the revenues a little bit upfront relative to the capital expenditures and we already talked about it with uh, with a little bit showing that the revenues actually haven't changed all that much over this entire period uh, so really you could say it's not so much the revenues as much as the capital base I do know that this is 2012 through 2016 so this is perhaps post the financial crisis period you can I, I don't have the the numbers for that period but it's pretty decent and easy to see why an experiential special line retailer such as this might have had a rough time during that period so I can imagine maybe they took some serious hits to their retained earnings and their overall equity during these years and that could possibly explain why the sales cap ratio is high that's totally just a conjecture though but uh, that's uh, perhaps a good reason that could explain it um, or, or it's possible that they just had sustainably high levels of sales capital ratio ever since they first opened in I think they said it was 97 when they first uh, opened so it's possible that they just had really really high sales capital ratio since they first came out and that now they're finally starting to come down into steady state that's for their industry this is definitely more in line with what you would expect um, but either way so we can kind of use maybe a longer term average for the base here that we we'll use yeah I think five year average makes sense for that uh, we will kind of uh, Let's see what was it? It was 2.99 for the for the industrial expectation and 5.81 for the net margin expectation. If you look at the PE over the period, you can see that in the period where they had the high sales capital ratio in the first five, it was pretty much all over the place. Uh, partially because they had really low earnings or negative earnings for a few of these years, uh, so we had only a two years where the PE was kind of in more of a typical range, giving us uh, an average of 15 to 16 just between those two. If we include kind of other more typical years where the PE is in at least a, a typical range that we expect to get more of an average of about 11 to 12, that's against their trading currently at six to six and a half. Again, that could be arguable, argued that the reason it has to be six and a half is because their earnings are expected to drop and that this year's revenues is particularly special, but we'll, we'll see what we think about that as well. Um, taking a look at the shareholders equity over the entire period, you can see it's actually essentially flat we were saying that it was decreasing over the five year period, but that was because it's kind of moved up in this mid period. But overall, it's technically slightly up, but mostly just kind of barely moved. I can see the liabilities have moved up pretty significantly, not quite a doubling, but about 70% increase. Uh, while the assets have increased, uh, what looks like maybe about also a 70% increase, which would all be in line with the fact that the shareholders equity is basically about flat. Uh, retained earnings are technically up over the period. So it was a little bit of a chaotic run through it, but overall the balance sheet is actually pretty stable across the entire 10 year period. It's just has some serious volatility in any of the two or three year periods in the midst of it. So that's pretty good to see. Um, looking at the returns on invested capital, that was another thing that we thought was extremely chaotic. Let's see if maybe shifting to a nine year rolling uh, average it makes it any better not really uh so that's definitely one thing that's this company doesn't have going for it is that when in good years the returns invested capital and the return on equity are extraordinarily good um, but when it does have bad years it's really really bad which puts it into uh kind of a rough position which definitely means we're gonna have to be especially conservative i think in making our assumptions and that probably doesn't bode well for its valuation but either way um, overall for the cash flow they didn't really do much paying out to shareholders over the entire period there was a couple of years where they did some solid buybacks but other than that it's mostly just some uh, shifts and through uh, employee options and things like that over the entire period it comes out to an average of six million dollars per year and it is worth noting that the years that they do pay are years in which they actually do get excess cash flow so they aren't ones to just be out here throwing cash to their shareholders just because uh, they do seem to have it well in line with what they expect the average over the entire period comes out to about three million that they could have paid out so the fact that they paid out six million on average is technically means that they were still overpaying though uh, so even though that they they only paid out in in the good years it might have been better for them to not be paying out instead and holding on to that cash in order to buffer their balance sheet against the bad years is perhaps an argument you could make and then looking at the the margin over an even longer period let's see if maybe that helps and makes it any more stable probably not um, yeah comes down to basically zero uh, this, uh, this company definitely doesn't really want to give us any sort of uh, stable period upon which to make any sort of generalized uh, assumptions for the future but whatever we'll come up with what we can for that um, perhaps just rely on the industrial expectations uh, numbers 
Uh, so anyway, I did use the list number for, for the interest rate because they also don't really have in, their interest payments listed on their income statement, partially because they don't really have too much in the way of normal listed debt. It's mostly just lease liabilities, which we count as debt. And so getting into the revenues, you can see it right here. This is what I was sort of saying, going from 380 to 379, 392, all the way across 350, 330, 255, the low in 2020, and then bounce back to 411 in 2021. So, I mean, you know, over the entire 10 year period, the average revenue was $359 million in any one given year, uh, which is a little bit lower than 2012. Uh, and, and yet in 2021, we're still higher than that average and 2021, which just goes to show that during the interim, the numbers actually dipped down pretty solidly and then bounced back. So you could say that between 2012 and 2019, that there was a decrease in, in revenue, you could say over this entire period. Uh, but you could also say that, well, there's the bounce back in 2021. So that's really the argument. It's like, how do, how do we think about this 25% drop in 2020? and then a 61% bounce back in 2021 in frame of the fact that they were technically on a relatively slow decline of about 2% per year in the eight years prior to that. Uh, do, we, do we consider this an actual growth or do we consider this uh, a, uh, a fluke or do we consider this uh, period between 2012 and 2019 to be the fluke and that the adjustment came back in 2021 when people realized that experiential uh, retail is actually pretty awesome or something. You know, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. I, like I said, I do have my revenue model, which we'll get into. So scrolling over, you can see the numbers kind of come out to this. Don't get too hung up on that number. We do have all the other assumptions and stuff that we have to get into. Uh, we will get straight into the revenue model that I built, which I have right here. Um, they provide in their 2016 uh, 10K, they provide uh, store numbers for, for North America as well as square footage uh, their total square footage for all of their stores in North America. They don't provide it any sooner than 2016. So in order to make this, this model, I kind of have to rely on the assumption that the square footage uh, hasn't really shifted that much. The square footage per store hasn't really shifted that much, uh, which I think is not a huge assumption to make, but that is one assumption I do have to make uh, in order to do this revenue model because a lot of the information they stopped giving after 2016, and they only gave the store information thereafter. Um, but we are going to base it off the of square footage. So that's just one of the things that we're doing here. But either way, you can see that between 2012 and 2016, they had an average of 275 stores in North America with an average of, of about 749,000 square footage, which comes to about 2,700 square foot per store. Uh, and uh, they also had the net retail sales per store in North America of $381. Uh, so that's to be some of the assumptions that we're basing this five-year previous period on and then i also take 2017 2018 2019 which is uh the pre-covid period average and like i said they don't give us the square footage information for that but we do they do give us the store information which is 309 stores on average so you can see that in the pre-covid era um, era uh they had increased their sales or increased their stores approximately three percent per year relative to the average of the five years from there so they were increasing their stores before COVID, uh, and then they did actually close some stores uh, since then. Uh, and then the square the, the the sales per square foot had come down from three hundred eighty one dollars to three hundred forty four dollars. So they increased their stores while lowering the profitability of those stores is essentially what what I've discovered through this. Um, so with that in mind, we can decide what we think about the future of these stores. I have twenty twenty six right here. Um, I assume that they're, the stores are going to uh, increase at the same rate they did, 3% in sort of a best case scenario. Uh, I'm giving them 354 stores in 2026, and then I'm assuming that uh, they decline at twice the rate that the, uh, that the sales per store was already declining prior to 2019 in the worst case scenario. And the reason why I choose that is that they could choose to realize that the stores are becoming less profitable and therefore quickly reverse course and start to lower the stores rather than at a faster rate than the prices they're lowering, which would be the efficient option to do amongst those decisions. So basically that's how I think of it is that they could choose to increase their stores by 3% per year, or they could choose to decrease their stores by 5% per year. And those are my best case and worst case scenarios for store count. Now we're gonna keep the average square footage of 2,700 per square feet in both these scenarios. That, like I said, that's the thing I'm kind of relying on from the past is not changing too much. And based off of that, we can come up to 
Uh, also an assumption about the, the growth of sales per store. We could assume that the growth of sales per store actually does increase from this point on and it grows at the rate of uh, inflation that I've used as my projected rate of inflation that I've come up with uh, through for, for several other valuations in the past. I can cover that at some point if you want. But basically the number that I've projected for, for inflation for the next 10 years on a compounded rate, including the start of this year, that's the important part you have to understand. It includes the, 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 some of the growth that we've already gone through. It's a 10 year projected inflation from the start of 2022 to the end of 31. And that would be 3.74%. So I'm, I'm using that as the upper bound of sales growth. We're assuming that their, sale, their sales per store just grows with inflation at the upper bound. And the lower bound, we're going to assume that same negative 5%, which is double the previous rate. So between that, that means I get a sales per uh, square foot of $485 in the best case and a sales per square foot of $312 in the worst case. I multiply the sales per square foot times the store times the square footage and I end up with $469 million in the best case scenario and $312 million in the worst case scenario for my, my North America sales uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in 2026. Uh, which gets me a growth of three uh three and a half percent to negative four point seven five percent as my bounds and again this is just the north america retail sales but the north america retail sales uh in includes uh pretty much the majority of their their business it includes let me show right here about 87 percent of their business so i think it's a relatively good proxy for the overall growth of their company we're not going to use these numbers as the sales that we're projecting for them to actually have we're just going to use these growth rates so i'll say three and a half and five as my bounds uh so that's my that's my revenue model for build a bear workshop i definitely think it's more likely that they uh have a little bit of shrinkage rather than than growth over the period but not necessarily a a, a drastic amount so this current this most recent year is a huge growth and i can see it coming down a little bit from that level but not necessarily a, a drastic level either so yeah well we'll use that as my probability distribution or as my revenue uh, model distribution as far as probabilities go um we'll probably go ahead and just kind of leave it as is i think for for now i don't really uh feel the need to to shift it around a whole lot um we will go down to the debt to equity ratio and start with that next because that's kind of generally where we go uh wow so the leverage definitely flips it out hold on i probably need to adjust yeah that's i gonna say the tax rates being screwy that's part of the reason <laughs> it's like that, that i would say that cost of equity could not be right but the tax rate was not right and wow that changed everything didn't it uh because the the tax rate going into the debt to equity ratio was negative and more than 100 percent, so it was kind of screwing uh, with the cost of equity uh, so okay, with a 32% debt to equity ratio, we end up with a cost of equity of about 10%, not too crazy, uh, nothing too drastic. The overall uh, cost of capital is pretty high of 7.5% because they do have a relatively high interest rate and they do have more equity than debt on, on debt, uh, so, but that's not terrible per se, it's just a question of whether or not they can achieve returns of capital above that, which again, we were having tr difficulty getting a consistent return on invested capital number for them uh, due to some of the more complicated years in their margins. Uh, so they're currently at $300 million market cap. We can easily see them having a pretty solid crash in their market cap due to them being so small. And then on the uh, assumption that they could perhaps take on a decent amount more debt than they currently have, it's actually pretty easy to see how they could end up with a debt to equity ratio of around 100%. Um, but likewise, it's not a large amount of debt and under certain circumstances, I could see them paying off a decent amount of it as well. Probably not all of it, um, but easily uh, half or even a little bit more than half perhaps under certain circumstances. And maybe 100% being a, a higher bound because of the, of the way that this is kind of a linear extrapolation of the debt to equity ratios across the five models. So I'll put, do a little bit less than 100%, maybe 90%, that leaves 10 to 90% uh, with the expected value for the analyst number at 25 relative to them currently being at 32, that's probably fine. That leaves our expected value about 46. Um, I'm probably okay with that. Leave that there for now. We can maybe come back to that number in a minute. Uh, so let's take a look at the sales capital ratio. Sales capital ratio we see as pretty solid and also probably the most consistent out of all of these numbers. Uh, we can we can rely on it a little bit more solidly. I'd say one maybe as lower bound, perhaps maybe something like three as the upper bound. 
that brings it to two. Uh, we could probably go a little bit higher than that. Um, let's see, three and a half maybe on the upper bound. And then we'll bring this to 2.5. That brings the expected value to 2.4. We can also probably raise the lower bound too. Um, let's see, 1.25 or 1.5 maybe. That's gonna bring the, the midpoint to 2.5. I do wanna assume that it comes back down maybe a little bit, but not necessarily a huge amount. So 2.53 I think is a pretty reasonable uh, place to leave it. That's somewhat conservative. Or actually, you know what? We may, maybe we we won't be we won't be very conservative on the sales and capital ratio. That's actually what we're gonna do. We're not gonna be conservative on the sales and capital ratio because we're gonna be conservative on the margin. So we're not gonna double punish them. Let's actually let's actually re readjust our thinking a little bit here. Let's make sure we punish them once fully in the right spot. Uh, that's kind of something you key you generally want to do. It's like when you're dealing with uh, some sort of difficulties in a company, it can be difficult to not like punish them for it multiple times in different places. It's much better to try to compartmentalize a risk into one specific spot and deal with it. So if margins is what we're concerned about, we're just gonna be conservative on the margins, but try not to let that fall into the capital efficiency part of their business. That's the part where they excel. So we'll go ahead and leave, let them have that. Um, and then we'll probably go ahead and apply that same logic to the uh, debt to equity ratio as well. Um, so maybe not 90%, maybe lower to 80% brings the expected value down to 42, which is only a, a little bit higher than the current level. Maybe we can lower this as well. All right, so that leaves it 39 is the expected value for the debt to equity ratio. It's higher than it currently is, but not so much that it feels like I'm punishing them drastically, so that's okay. So now that leaves the margins, which is where we gotta, we gotta get pretty brutal on them. Now, as I guess where things like I said get complicated, we can see over a two year period, the average is uh, 1.25%. Out in the third year, it's 1%. Four years, it's negative. Five years, it's zero. Six years, still zero. Seven years, it becomes 1%. So, looking at any sort of historical record of their margin, it's just atrocious. There's basically no way to look at this and consider it good. You can look at the most recent year and say, well, well, hey, this is them during a really, really great year and it got them 11 to 12%. So maybe half of that would be a good number for a kind of a medium term year, right? Maybe you could think of it like that. Uh, you could also say, well, let's look at the 10 years and try to take out the outliers. You know, that's another way to try to think about this. And it's like, let's try to take out the outliers. Let's take out the worst year they have and also the best year they have, uh, maybe uh, two of each. Let's take out the, 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 the worst and best twice over we end up with an average of about zero still. So we still don't really get anything useful at trying to look at any sort of historical average of their margins, which basically leaves me with really one other option left, which is either A, to rely on, well, I guess it's two options, A, to rely on that history, or B, I can go with this industrial expectation that I come up with for a lot of other companies. This is part of the reason I do this, even though it often seems like I may not use these numbers, like the industrial expectation of the sales cap ratio and the net margin. Sometimes you just don't have company specific information to rely on. I can see the sales cap ratio for their industry, their pretty much in line with. Uh, so why not assume maybe that they're reasonably in line with it on the net margin as well? Uh, that gets us a five to six percentage number. We'll probably trim it closer to five because I think that number has been relatively high in the most recent year relative to other numbers. So with that, we can use that maybe as our assumption. Let's use maybe two to, to seven or eight percent or something like that uh, as, our, as our bound. It gives us 5% as a midpoint. Uh, and then maybe we can use like 6% as the analyst number. Like it's just an expected value of 5, 5.28%. Uh, so let's see, let's take a look at some other things. Is there anything else we need to majorly adjust? We might come back down to the sales capital ratio. Now, obviously that looks like we completely obliterated the value to it, but the, uh, the alternative, we can also maybe use one as the base here. That will improve their value a decent bit because that means they're not going to immediately come down to the terrible years they had going going from 11.5% down to 1% next year. Maybe they won't have a 1% margin next year uh, and they won't have a 12% margin by the terminal year, but perhaps next year's number will just be a little bit lower than that. It'll come down to 10%. Maybe that's even considered a little bit too much. I'm not sure, but there's no other particular year average we can use that's better than that. Uh, so we'll just use it. We'll just assume it, it coasts downward from 12% down to 5%, which is about the most, uh, the most 
race we can kind of assume for them. Um, let's see. Where did that leave with this worst case scenario? Fine. Anything else? Where did, where did that leave the expected returns of invested capital? Expected returns of invested capital end up at 13 14% with those assumptions, which puts it well above the cost of capital. So it's hard to argue that we didn't uh, give them more than what they deserve necessarily if we aren't going to necessarily punish them super badly in the margins like we did like we did because i mean it's lower than the 12 percent but by giving them the grace of saying that it's going to go smoothly from the 12 percent down to five percent that actually gave them a huge benefit so if with that i would argue that we're actually not giving them the the we're not uh, being conservative on the margins the way we're saying maybe we would so with that maybe we can assume that this is actually a little bit lower uh, maybe 2.5 for the analyst number, which will pull down the expected value to 2.59. It's not a huge hit, but uh, before, like I said, you could have argued that maybe we were being a little bit too kind to them. Uh, so let's see, anything else? Anything else? I think that's just about it. Expected value at 13, 14%. Net margin expected about 5%. Expected revenues negative less than 1% per year. Yeah, okay. So I think that'll be it. We'll do the adjustment for the default risk. Um, that's the last thing we'll need to do. Let's see, what was their terminal debt loads going to look like? They have $32, $33 million in cash right now. I can see in their best case scenario that they actually do pay off the terminal debt loads. So we'll leave that at zero. And then beyond that, we'll use the the numbers that come off of my default risk table. Seven four. Decent amount of default risk in some of these worst case scenarios. Which uh, lines up with sort of what we were saying about what we saw in the history is that they do have a decent amount of uh complicated volatile times sometimes. It's like it's a good it's a good business seemingly. Um, but not necessarily one that's good every year all the time. Okay, so that'll do it for BBW. Build a Bear Workshop. U.S. Treasury selling for 2.857%. Uh, mature market equity risk premium I currently have is 5.01%. The discount rate I come up with for Build a Bear after adjusting for company specific idiosyncratic risks, I get 10.25%. Uh, they do not pay uh, a dividend currently, although they have had special dividends from time to time, uh, but not a regular dividend. Uh, five years ago, they had sales of $364 million against sales in the most recent year of $412 million, which gave them 2.5% sales growth each year for the last five years. They have sales to capital ratio uh, for long run average of 2.61% relative to the industrial expectation currently of 299 uh, The returns of invested capital they've had over the long run has been a pretty measly 1.63%. Uh, coming off of the back of again some some negative uh, years that they generally had to deal with from time to time uh, The debt to equity ratio currently is about 32 to 33 percent and they have a pretty negligible debt risk of about 0.69 percent currently The profit margin in the most recent year has been 11 and a half percent against the industrial expectation of about five to six percent And they currently have 47 million dollars in profit uh, They have a currently selling price for 18 dollars and 10 cents the probability distribution that we're using for the company is uh, our premature defaults, roughly normal distribution, which gets us a probability or a revenue distribution of anywhere from 318 million in the worst case scenario five years from now to 489 million in the best case scenario, uh, which is an expected value of 397 million, which gets us a sales growth of anywhere from negative five percent in the worst case scenario to possibly 3.5 percent in the best case scenario. On expected basis, we see negative 0.71 percent. We have an expected sales cap ratio of 2.59, slightly lower than the current level. Uh, returns invested capital of 13.66%, which assumes that they will climb back up pretty solidly close to where they were uh, longer in the past, uh, much better than the most recent year rougher period. Uh, the debt to equity ratio, we assume will actually climb a little bit to perhaps around 39%, which will give them an increased default risk of about 1.84% per year, which is definitely more than you typically like to see. I like to see generally no more than about 1% of default risk per year. Anything more than that is something that I would consider substantial because it is a per year uh, compounded uh, risk. And the profit margin, I, I have a distribution of anywhere from 2% to 8%. On an expected basis, we see 5.28%. 
that gets us a profit distribution of anywhere from six million dollars to possibly 39 million dollars in the best case scenario on expected basis we see 21 million dollars uh, pretty interesting to see though and to note that the, the best case scenario profit that i see for the company is less than the current year's profit uh, so that's just one way to look at it. They very well might have a significantly less amount of shares though in that year So that's one thing to keep in mind is that this if this is the case There's a good chance that they probably have bought back a lot of their shares during that period uh, Which would explain why the price would be the projection that I have under that circumstance because like I've said before You don't uh, affect share prices or anything in this. This is this assumes the same share count This assumes no dividends paid out. It just assumes that all the cash is just collected and belongs to the shareholder it doesn't really matter how it gets returned but the point is, is it very well might be returned in the form of share buybacks whatever i digress uh the present value uh that we come up with using the discount rate that we uh, they also came up with we end up with 16 dollars 24 per share which is 10 dollars or 10 percent lower than the current share price uh, we also have five-year forward value targets unadjusted for any dividends that they could choose to pay out during the period if they do of anywhere from nine dollars and 19 cents in the worst case scenario to possibly 56 dollars and 94 cents in the best case scenario on an expected basis we see 26 dollars and 45 cents which compared to the current share price implies a return of 7.88 percent per year for the next five years uh, so definitely not a uh, not a terrible return um, but not a risk adjusted return uh, is essentially what it comes down to a better return than the SP 500 probably only barely um, but it would probably be much more volatile than the S&P 500 which means unless you've got the stomach to buy on those lower share prices you won't do as well in fact if you do have the stomach to buy on the share lower share prices you probably will do better because that's how volatility works uh, but it's because volatility is not actually a risk it's just a it's just a, a proxy for risk according to the cap M model right so that is one thing to keep in mind about this is that that's what that implies. It's the reason why we have a difference between the present value and the future value. It's part of the reason I like looking at the future values because the future value strips out a lot of that volatility based thinking and instead thinks about more of, okay, what's the value added five years out and like what's the implied internal rate of return, the yield to maturity in order to achieve that price, which is effectively what I do when I come up with this uh, expected implied return is that it's effectively a yield to maturity. Uh, so anyway whatever also digressing a little bit further the short-term pricing metrics based off of uh, regressions of its multiples against that of the sp500 gets us a suggested price of 21 dollars per share uh, which could perhaps explain why it's a trades up as high as it is is that it does have such low multiples that people see that in the short-term pricing takes over even though the cash flows don't entirely back it up um, but yeah, like I said, either way, uh, when I said I said at the start of the stream that even if this didn't look like a great value today, it would definitely be the type of company that I would love to have in the the watch list just to just to watch because you know who knows it could drop down to twelve dollars per share or something over the next three months and then suddenly it looks like a great deal. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Definitely going to be keeping my eye on it. I think it's a great business. I just definitely think that it's low margins and the type of uh, kind of very discretionary form of business that it's in means that it's going to go through rough times, and those rough times uh, have to be have to be priced in accordingly. Uh, so maybe we'll pick it up when it uh, when it goes through one of those times. Uh, not today. So. Uh, as I have said a few times, if you are watching, still watching, and have not already, please like the stream. I see uh, we have three likes and three concurrent viewers right now, so I don't know if the, if the people, I know we had more than that before, so I don't know who has come or not come or go. Uh, but if you haven't already liked the stream, please like the stream, please subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, again, we're looking to do Hibbit on Thursday. That's Thursday, not Friday. We're switching our stream schedule around a little bit again, back to a Monday and Thursday so that when I do have uh, content every other week in the form of produced videos, I can release it on Saturday and have it more evenly distributed throughout the week. That's kind of the going plan. So Thursday, I will be doing Hibbit as an extreme after that. Uh, and then we have these companies as kind of the general list thereafter, though it is a little bit more informal of lists. It's not a hard list per se, but that's, this is the kind of the tentative schedule as it currently stands. Uh, either way, thank you for watching. It's pretty great. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> I see. I see it now. Thank you very much. Uh, either way, thank you all for for coming. I will catch.